Welcome everybody to Bookends Online Edition, produced by the Wadena County Historical Society and Travel and Story Cellar in collaboration with New York Mills Regional Cultural Center. Bookends is made possible by the voters of Minnesota through a grant from the Five Wings Arts Council, thanks to a legislative appropriation from the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Blood on the Bridal Wreath is the first of a four book series called Filthy Dirty Garden Gloves. From its great title to its delicious ending, this delightfully clever mystery is a remarkable romp with a devoted cat owner and expert gardener who seems to attract both danger and devotion. Bookends programs from previous authors are now available on the web's website of the Wadena County Historical Society at www.wadenacountyhistory.org. Today's program will also be available on the website shortly. This month's speaker is Maggie Fuller. Next month's bookends will be held Jan Saturday, January 8th, 2022. If you have questions for today's author, feel free to enter them through the chat. Now, let's welcome to Bookends Online Edition, Maggie Fuller. Welcome. Hello, thanks for having me. I uh, go by the pen name M.E. Fuller, but among friends, Maggie <laughs> too. <laughs> uh, so I miss having the in-person events. When I put out my first book, uh, Wadena County Historical Society uh, brought me in to talk and it's so much, it's so nice with people in the room and, and questions. So I welcome anybody's questions. Um, Filthy Dirty Garden Gloves, which is right here. And I will, uh, this is Blood on the Bridal Wreath. I will read some of this in a little bit. This is my second book, my first book, Saving the Ghost is a uh, literary piece. It's dramatic. It's an intense story of a woman's healing from childhood trauma. Uh, Shirlene is in the process, one of our guests here is in the process of reading it and she's, she's feeling the impact. <laughs> and it was really intense to write. And so I thought, well, I need to take a turn and do something much more fun. I love BBC murder comedies. You ever see those like Death in Paradise, for example? Mm -hmm. I had to create a colorful cast of characters that are totally chaotic, uh, build relationships, and then throw in a little murder, a little misguided romance, uh, and as much fun as I could must muster. Uh, and there is a foil, of course. There always has to be some comic foil, and it is the cat. Uh, the protagonist has a cat who is always underfoot and manages to create havoc wherever it goes. I'm not sure what else to say about the <laughs> bridal wreath. It's a fun read. And the second book uh, in the series will be From Hot House to Heaven, and that will be published next summer. Cool. So what, um, are you at all inspired by what they call the cozy mysteries? Oh, this is absolutely a cozy mystery uh, with a twist. It's a little uh, more raunchy than your typical <laughs> cozy mystery, but it has all the elements. It has the female protagonist. It has the village people, you know, the community, and then some interest that all that that uh, combines them all, which is the uh, the fictional town is Buffalo View Village, and this is around the Buffalo View Village Garden Club and the members and things that happen to them. It's relationship driven, right? Hi, Mary. It's uh, relationship driven rather than crime driven, and it's meant to be a chaotic read. I haven't, of course, looked at this since I published it. Uh, we haven't had enough in-person events where I really had to talk about it much. So I thought I would sit down and read it. <laughs> and I started laughing right away. So I knew I did my job. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I, I'll talk a little bit about my background. I didn't come to uh, professional writing until uh, I was 63. As many people we don't have the time or the resources to pursue creative things that we'd like to do until we step away from our employment 
Uh, and my husband and I both agreed when my job was terminated that I put my energies into creative practice and tried to build a business um, that would sustain me through, you know, the end of our lives. So I took up painting again. You can see there's a painting in the background that's in progress. And I went to the Five Wings Arts Council, and I lived in Brainerd at the time, and asked them for funds to learn how to write a book. How to write a novel because I didn't know I've been writing since I was a little kid but I didn't really know how to put a story together I didn't know what structure was I didn't know what the elements needed to be I didn't know any of that so five wings uh they're such a great resource and they stepped in they actually gave me a second grant for the first book to get it edited uh it needed an edit it needed a, a developmental edit it needed a copy edit and then it needed to be rewritten again and edited again. It was about a seven year process. Um, and then when I moved, I now live in Montevideo, uh, Minnesota. Uh, when I moved here, this regional arts council again is so supportive. They are supporting me in my art practice. Uh, but you know, we just hands down, we creative people just thank so much the state legislature for putting these funds aside or artists. So Lina was asking me about my writing practice. Um, and I will say I am likely more disciplined than most. I have a, a weekday schedule. So I get up in the morning, 8.30, I'm at my desk. I write for, I, I have a word count I want to hit. So I, <clears throat> excuse me, I allow three hours. It usually takes less than that, but <clears throat> I keep my chapters short. So I can usually do a chapter a day. Uh, and then after that's done, I will go back and, and, um, and edit. But I just want to get the story out. And with these cozy mysteries, I have learned from writing the first book, I really need, I don't have to know all the story elements, but I have to have a sense of <clears throat> who is where uh, and, and a plot point. So I have a big spreadsheet where I write everything out. And then as I finish a chapter, I'll go in and put any notes. I'll go back and read it. And it's like, well, where did that come from? What are you talking about? Nobody knows what that is. Write the notes. So the next day I can go back in and plump it up a little bit. So I'm writing all the time. I'm also an encourager of writers. Any of you who have wanted to start a writing practice, or and just don't seem to have the time, feel free to get a hold of me and I'll encourage you into it. <laughs> it will become a writer. So what else can I share with you? Um, <clears throat> are you a big gardener? Is that sort of where the inspiration for the series came from or just? Oh, I am. Oh yes, oh yes. When I lived in Brainerd, we had um, close to an acre uh, that was just there. And I told my husband, I told my husband to, I didn't ask him, I said, build raised bed rock boxes because all of the soil there is sand. So he built a series of boxes. I wish I had a picture to show you. It was magnificent. We had uh, a good quarter of an acre just covered with these garden boxes that were flowers and vegetables. And I put in apple trees and it was incredible. Oh. And when we moved from there, uh, we bought a house in Montevideo that's on a corner lot. So of course, one side of that lot is now all boxes. And as in Brainerd, half of what we grow goes to the local food shelf. So there's even more, uh, more reason to make sure that everybody gets pruned and fertilized and watered and, uh, and picked and plucked and all the things that you need to do with a vegetable garden. Uh, I just love it. And that's one of the things with the cozy mystery uh, people, I've had people ask me, well, how did you come up with this? And I said, you know, because they say, well, I like to do that, but I don't know how. I said, all you need is a community and some specific interest of the protagonist. Uh, for example, I knew somebody whose father was a dentist in a small community. There you go. You don't need anything else to start because all the patients they're gonna see and why things happen to their teeth, whatever. I mean, each one of those events can turn into a cozy mystery. Complicated. 
So yes, gardening, I love it. Cool. Can you give us a little selection to read, maybe? Sure, yeah, I will read the first chapter here. I've got a second chapter that I will read. Uh, I can't, of course, read too many of these chapters because you have to read them to find out what happens. So I will read chapter one, Blood on the Bridal Wreath. A basket of freshly harvested young and tender turnip greens, greens at her feet. Mrs. Julian Stanch stood to stretch. Oh my, ache and ache and she mumbled to no one except maybe the cat. The cat was a nine-year-old striped tabby always underfoot. Mrs. Julian Stanch, or Justy, as she was called by the more informal types about town, stepped on the cat's tail at the height of her stretch. Both parties screamed. The cat with claws extended etched deep grooves into the flesh of Mrs. Stanch's shapely left leg, drawing blood. Oh, Lordy, she exclaimed, thinking instead what she would never utter aloud, damnable cat. The cat launched itself off her leg to race toward a nearby bridal wreath bush in full bloom. Just then, the handsome new Episcopal priest, Reverend Persons, and his beautiful buxom wife of 25 years, Lucille, or Busty, as she was called by the more informal types about town, passed by the front yard picket fence. Did you hear that? Lucille's voice was high and thin and urgent. She pushed through the white four slat gate without waiting for her husband to reply. Hello, are you all right? Lucille cried out as she rounded the back side of the house approaching Mrs. Stanch's garden. The cat flew past her yowling as if a territorial battle with the neighbor's yellow cat were in full sway. Oh, Lucille jumped with fright, tripped over the cat and fell face first into the bridal wreath bush, sending the cat scurrying and screaming under the back porch steps. My dear Reverend Persons, reaching his wife just as she plummeted into the bridal wreath blossoms, managed to catch her before she reached the ground. Pulling her back toward himself, wishing to soothe her and examine her wounds, he heard Mrs. Julian Stanch scream again. Mrs. Stanch, her face stricken and shy and, and ashy white, her left leg covered in blood, both oozing and dried, extended her arm toward her beloved bridal wreath. Oh, Lord above, she shrieked, is that your blood? Reverend Persons, his wife firmly grasped in his arms, took in the sight that was Mrs. Stanch's bloody leg and the bridal wreath bush, one side of which was well crushed and covered in what looked to be blood, bright red against the stark white blossoms. This was certainly not the blood of his wife who sustained a few minor scratches in her fall. Reverend Persons set his wife on her feet, brushed her off with loving tenderness, inspected each small abrasion on her face. It is not my wife's blood, Mrs. Stanch. And in the most accusatory of tones, he continued, what happened here? Mrs. Stanch stammered, I, I don't know. I was in my garden harvesting turnip greens, greens when I stepped on the cat's tail. And then this happened. She swept her hand across her bloody leg. And now you're here and I see this. She stares without a gesture at her bush. Well, Mrs. Stanch, this blood is fresh and appears to be fresher than the blood on your leg. The Reverend's tone was unkind. I'm going to call the police. As he reached for his phone, his lovely wife stopped him. Please don't, dear. All could see the relief on Mrs. Stanch's face. Officers will trample Mrs. Stanch's yard and garden. They'll make a terrible mess. Besides, the blood could have come from anywhere. The Reverend paused to study his wife. That much blood? Someone was killed here or mortally wounded at the very least. I am calling the police. At that precise moment, Larry Granger, the local organic farmer who lost, excuse me, who lost his dear wife only two years before, came strolling around the corner of Mrs. Stanch's house. Mrs. Stanch, ashen and bloody, Mrs. Persons scratched and shaky, and Reverend Persons, his determined hand on his cell phone, looked up at once to see Larry looking at them. <clears throat> what in the hell has happened here? Larry Granger was the best looking man in four adjoining counties and he had a thing for Mrs. Julian Stanch, a widow of nine years. Mrs. Stanch never used her given name of Gloria <clears throat> because as she said many times to gossiping ladies of the church, I don't need a man, I don't want a man, I don't want to give any indication at any time, place or instance 
that a man could entertain the idea of me as escort or companion. So she was averse and perhaps even ignorant of Granger's intentions. Yet Granger busied himself in his free time, all of it, at the work of wearing down Gloria's defenses. Today he arrived at her home with a gift of rare heirloom scarlet runner bean, bean, bean seeds, the blooms well known to attract hummingbirds, butterflies, and bees. Mrs. Julian Stanch needed no additional opportunities to draw pollinators to her garden. Her garden in bloom was alive with all manner of industrious insects, hoarding and swapping pollen. But Larry, the stranger to subtlety, eager to woo her, would not overlook a chance to insist himself upon her good nature as a woman and fellow gardener. As an organic farmer, Larry was savvy in the ways of safe yet effective fertilizing of crops for the greatest yield. He could handle a rebuff or setback from a spotted winged Drosophila or aphid. A man of patience and persistence, he knew how to coexist with or conquer threats to his farm, but in a good way, as he was so fond of saying. Like a bee needing a coax to find his Hubbard and acorn squash at first blossom, so too would the staunchly adverse Mrs. Stanch require a soft touch of encouragement. His intent to transplant the beautiful backyard gardener to his own 80 acres of farmland would succeed. He believed this with all his heart, for one so handsome had never lost a game of love or lust. All eyes were on Larry now, all lips were still. Behind him, a wooden ladder came down, crashing on top of the back porch steps. A sound of splintering was followed by a curse. Damn it! This was followed by another scream from the cat, now on a dead run from beneath the steps to some other more distant hiding place. Larry turned toward the crashing sound to see Hank Roden, the village's most popular handyman, known for his craftsmanship and fair prices, sprawled on blood-soaked ground. Damn it, Hank mumbled again into the moist dirt. Larry raced to help him up from his fall. At that moment, everyone noticed, just beyond the blood-covered Broden, an oft-used metal paint bucket emptied of its contents when it too fell from the ladder. First a unified gasp, then a unified ah rose from the bystanders in Mrs. Stanch's backyard. The blood in the bridal wreath was not in fact blood at all. Reverend Persons dropped his phone set to dial 911. A faint background voice could be heard had anyone been listening. Hello, is everything all right? This was quickly followed by the sound of sirens wailing from a squad car dispatched for an unknown emergency. The sounds of brakes screeching, car doors slamming, and noisy boots running were followed by a most insistent pounding away on Mrs. Hanch's front door. Open up, police. Unhappily for the cat, its haven was through the front entrance cat door. It had nearly settled itself when the police shouted just outside. The cat, all hairs flared, not bothering with a hiss or snarl, disappeared to the upper regions of the house. Cries of back here could not be heard above the din. The Reverend's wife took flight around the house to signal the two uniformed officers to please quiet down. Shh, she mouthed, waving her arms at them, attempting to catch their attention. Officers Franklin and Lord had given up their pounding and readied themselves to break down the door when they spied Mrs. Persons and her frantic waving. Her mouth was so contorted by the shushing, they believed she may be suffering a stroke. In a moment, they were both upon her, one at her head, one at her feet, wrestling her to the ground as she would not cease her flailing. Stop that, the Reverend shouted at the officers, unleash my wife. He had followed her and watched in horror as the officers took his beloved to the ground. Both officers looked up at the shouting to see Reverend Persons and the others, including Hank Broden, coated in red paint. They promptly released Lucille Persons. What is going on here? Detective Franklin demanded an explanation for the emergency call while Detective Lord helped Lucille to her feet, never once lifting his eyes from her most alluring cleavage peeking out just enough from the edge of her knit top, just enough to tantalize, but certainly not meant to tempt. Do you need an ambulance? Detective Franklin noticed the fallen ladder, the spilled bucket of paint, and Hank's paint-covered overalls. No, sir, Hank replied with the utmost deference to Detective Franklin's authority. No, sir, he repeated. I just fell off of my ladder, just need to shake myself off is all. 
Detective Franklin nodded, folded up her notebook, and adjusted the hardware about her hips. All right, then, if there's nothing else. A lot of them shook their heads and waved the officers on their way. Oh, my, explained Mrs. Stanch as she turned back to her garden. My greens are all wilted. I must get them into the pot to steam. With that, she turned away from the others, wishing them to leave her alone to deal with the mess in her yard. I'll take care of the mess, ma'am, Hank cried out after her. Let me help you with that, Larry was at Mrs. Stanch's elbow, his hands on her garden basket before she could object. She pulled her elbow away from his grasp, though he clung to her basket's bottom. Thank you, Mr. Granger, but I don't need your help. Her tone, she felt, was sufficiently dismissive. She pulled her basket from his grasp, then turned her back on the two men remaining in the yard. Gloria walked up the back porch steps and entered her house to calm down stew her greens, and rest from the unexpected and most unwelcomed chaos of the morning. I see some smiles. That's good. <laughs> yeah, that was fun, Maggie. That was, um, I, I was wondering if something's going to happen where the cat went in the upper parts of the house, because it all seemed to follow the cat. But um that was really fun and, and the chaos is, uh, I mean, it's, it's hilarious. Thanks for reading that. Yay, <laughs> that's what I was going for. Uh, the whole book is like, and that's what I said, you know, I sat down and started reading it and wore myself out because it's so busy everywhere. So thank you for that. Anybody what else? Made you, what made you decide to do a series rather than an individual book? Because I guess your first title was a single book. Yes, it's just, Saving the Ghost is a standalone book. Uh, again, I'm influenced by BBC comedy, murder mysteries. Um, I like the characters. I like the relationship-driven um, format and the stories build, you get to know more and more about the individuals involved, and then they throw in a little mystery, right? And that's what I was going for. I wanted, and I wanted to challenge myself. Can I write a series? Well, I certainly can. I'm very excited to be working on this second book. Um, and it's good that I'm rereading this one because I need actually needed to do it again with a highlighter. So I remember, oh, that's how she talks, or oh, that happened to him, or this is something that needs to continue into the next story. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm after writing this book, it, and if you read it, you'll see that there are characters, uh, there are a couple of characters who could easily have a spinoff on their own. And I just had to tell myself to stop it. I have enough to do without creating a whole nother set, but who knows? We'll see how many days I have left in my life. Could happen. Yeah. You can always go back and be like, okay, now I want to explore so-and-so. Yes. Um, do, you, do you keep track? I know sometimes with series, it's harder to keep track of things, especially like minor stuff. I, for instance, I was um, binge reading um, the Andy Carpenter series by David Rosenfeld. And I noticed in one book, suddenly a minor character had a completely different name. And it kind of made me, you know, as the reader, you're like, wait, that's not the guy's name. And then you got to go back to the earlier book and be like, see, I'm not insane. You know, yes. <laughs> some sort of methodology of keeping track of things that come back. Well, the first step in that is to remember exactly what you said. And this is true with any writing. It's, I enjoy the process of writing, but ultimately <laughs> I want someone to read it. And if the reader, somebody said this to me and I, it's like a Bible verse to me now. Uh, if the if something takes the reader out of the story, it's my problem to, to fix that, to make, and that's actually one of the joys of, uh, of self-publishing, because if you say, well, but it was blue here and it was yellow there, I can quickly change it. The next people who buy the book, they, they won't have that problem. But yeah, I have a spreadsheet. I think I mentioned that, that I, I by chapter, I write the title of the chapter, who the characters are, and then I reread it after I've written it and I type in notes about what actually happened and I highlight, uh, Melissa is a, is a fan of spreadsheets, so she's probably laughing right now, but I highlight things that I have to remember to go back to. And then I have a column that says notes, don't forget, 
Uh, and then I review that. This book is so full of stuff going on. I have to congratulate myself for not missing a plot point. There are no plot holes in this book. Uh, but it, it took a lot of, again, as a writer, all of the information is in my head. And I don't necessarily know that it's not coming out for the reader, right? So uh, I have a writing group that's based in Brainerd. I love these people. And I would read some of these chapters dur during our monthly meetings. And there was a place in here where I talked about a character having a large diamond on her neck. And the question came, well, in what form? <laughs> was it a necklace? Was it a brooch? Was it a, you know, it was clear in my head, but it didn't show up on the page. Uh -huh. Oh, yes. I mean, even that detail is enough to drive somebody nuts and take them out of the store. <laughs> so, yeah, there's a lot to keep track of. And I'm excited about doing that. It's a challenge, right, to make sure, because this is not a streamlined story. What you just heard is going to look totally different when you get into the middle of the book, when you get to the end of the book. So, I, yeah, I, I'm not even... I'm just proud of myself that I got through it and uh, didn't fail you, as far as I know. <laughs> um, what made you decide to go with the self-publishing versus trying to find one of the publishing houses? Yeah, great question. So I will say that when I started writing Saving the Ghost, and this is uh, something people should, people who are writing should be aware of, um, I thought with all of the support I got, with the classes I took, you know, the, again, the Five Wings Arts Council paid for classes and workshops, and I went to everything I could. I learned from everybody I could, um, and I thought I had the story in place, and then I, I didn't, and then I thought I had it in place, and then I didn't, and then I pitched it, uh, it to some agents thinking, oh, I got this down, right? And I actually got the interest of a uh, New York uh, publishing house and of an, uh, an agent who, who was willing, there was something about the story that was compelling enough to him where he was willing to work with me a little bit. What I didn't know is that I didn't know enough to, to execute this material the way it needed to be done. And so he, he just gave up. He was very nice about it, but it was like he was done. By that time, since I didn't get started till I was 63, and I'd worked on that book for two years by then, I think. It had been three years at least previous. Um, I realized at my age, the way marketing works, and people don't necessarily know this, uh, those big blockbuster books that you can't wait to read, that's all marketing hype. So, so if I managed to get an agent, that could take anywhere from six months to a couple of years. Then they go through a process of pitching that book to a publisher who may or may not buy it. And if they do buy it, they may or may not publish it. You might not know that for a couple of years. I was counting the flowers on my grave. I thought, no, I can't. I need to just self-publish and move along because my goal was not to become a famous author. My goal was to supplement my income with doing something I love, which is writing and painting. So that's what I'm all about. Uh, and I count on people like you to just keep the momentum going so I can add you know, a little bit to my income every month. But yeah, so that's why I chose, it's not for everyone, but even young writers need to know that if, they get an agent and they get a book publisher, it does not mean that that book won't get pushed off the marketing plan when some other glittery thing comes along. I think that's why you see a lot of uh, people doing independent publishing. Um, I just, uh, the marketing work and effort is still gonna be the same. They just have a broader reach. So traditional publishers do. So that was why I made the choice that I made. Yeah, I worked in bookstores for a lot of years and that was our thing. We, we, we were like, 
okay, things like the latest James Patterson is going to sell really big for a couple weeks and then at most, and then it's going to be done because, you know, <laughs> books like that, like a lot of hype and they're buying the name and you're like, he can write the same book over and over again and you just keep buying it over and over again. Where right. other books that, you know, they'd come out and somebody would read them and they were so good, but nobody heard them like the help. Nobody heard of it in the beginning. And then people started reading it and reading it and right. somebody else. And the next thing you know, it was on the bestseller list for like two, three years. There's so that about, in, I, don't, do you, I don't know if you know the story of this. So the guy who, the kid who wrote the book, The Martian, can't think of his name at the moment, right? Do you know the story about him? Yeah, he, he and his buddies, oh gosh, he and his buddies, you know, sit in their basements. I imagine this is what happened. He's still at home, you know, in his basement doing his sci-fi things and, and writing stories. And they write these stories for their little niche group and they publish them, 99 cent books on Amazon or wherever they publish them and they'd read each other's books. And it happened that that particular book, Brown Publishing noticed, was selling really, really, really well. And they picked him up. And this kid writing, you know, the big blockbuster movie, The Martian with Matt Damon and growing potatoes on Mars or whatever. Um, this kid was so good at his scientific uh, theories, ideas, whatever his little sci, sci nerdy brain came up with. Uh, NASA invited him to come out see whatever it is they had to show him because he produced things they hadn't thought about. I mean, it's like a nerd's dream come true. <laughs> so there are books out there like that. There's going to be a lot of stuff that isn't good. I, I worried with the second one that it wasn't as well crafted as the first one. It's a different book. So I had to get comfortable with it. It's a different book. It's, you know, if it tells a story and it entertains and people want to get by the second one, that's fine. The first book is like an education and, oh, this is awful. <laughs> you know, it's a terrible tragedy that happened to her. And, and there is a niche market for that because there are people who need and want to understand the process of healing from trauma. There's other people who want to be entertained. <laughs> and so a cozy mystery. Cool. Um. Do you have any suggestions for someone who's just starting out, especially someone who might be starting later in life? Because um, I know it's like when you're 20, it's like, well, yeah, eventually you'll get there. But when you get in your 50s and 60s, suddenly you're looking at your watch going, I don't have a lot of time left. That's so. right. Talk about a time clock. Um, you know, I, I just, I call myself the encourager. I just encourage people to whatever their creative practice is that they've set aside to just get after it, you know, make five minutes, make 10 minutes, find ways that find people who will support you in that practice. Um, I don't teach because I'm always a learner. I'm an obsessive learner. So I don't teach. I can share and I can demonstrate. Uh, but what I say to you as words of encouragement may not fit with the other one over here. So find a writing group, write, write, write some more, write, take some classes, uh, learn from people who have done it and have done it well. Um, try to avoid the flashy people on the internet who say, oh, I can teach you this just by my marketing program or buy my classes for $29.99, you know, and you'll be, no, go with the tried and true. Minnesota is full of such accomplished authors that you can take classes from any one of them all the time uh, and never run out of things to learn. Uh, so no, I, I have, that's all I can say is just, I encourage you to do it, just do it. The worst that can happen is that no one will ever see what you write and, and you're frustrated with that, but that's the choice that you make. Uh, take the classes, do the writing. NaNoWriMo, you mentioned you're, you're doing that this month. Um, that's a great place to interact with other writers and people who uh, want to keep building that writing practice. So I don't, let's see, I want to tell you about uh, some books that are coming out in July uh, from Hot House to Heaven. So the blurb on that is 
uh, Gloria, oh, well, you won't know about this yet. <laughs> I can't read that to you because I don't know something that you shouldn't know yet. Um, I do, however, have uh, a book, a nonfiction book that's coming out in 2023. And it is, where's my paperwork? So the, the blurb on this, so my, my uh, family name is Bodie, um, married name is Fuller. Uh, so the next book up will be a nonfiction piece titled The Bodie Farm and Other Historical Notes on Home. Uh, and I'm hoping that we'll have in-person events because this is another one like Saving the Ghost, I think really benefits from people getting together and talking about it and chewing on it and tearing it apart. This will have a much broader appeal because it's both historical, Minnesota history, and genealogy. Uh, and uh, the blurb is lost in the woods for over a hundred years. A father's birthplace is rediscovered. Lost for a lifetime, a mother's family is found. These are stories of a daughter's search for connections to home, its places and people. What is home? I suppose for me, home is the place I'm anchored to this earth. It is a place I was born into among people who lost connection to their own homes and the people they were born among. To arrive at the place where each reconnects to home, where Humpty Dumpty sits on the wall, cracks and pieces glued in place, is what we're doing here. It is our only purpose. This book is about reconnecting to home for my mother, my father, and for me. So I found uh, the log cabin that my father was born in in 1903 is still standing. Oh. And that just opened up so many questions and so many feelings and so many thoughts about how people lived uh, prior to this modern sort of living where everybody's got a big house and two cars and 14 computers and a million devices. You know, he lived in a probably 30 by 40 structure, was born into a 30 by 40 structure that was the original train depot or a rail line that went through from Duluth to the Iron Range or to Ely. There were five rooms in that house, five partitioned rooms where this family functioned and, and had the train depot and, uh, and he, you think of, I think about how, what that experience must have been like. They, you know, they had families that interacted. They, they had lives that we recognized. They just, how they lived is so different. And then my mother was adopted when she was five. And a number of years ago, I found her through Ancestry, uh, found her family in Michigan. And here again, her, her mother, my grandmother, had been married three times. The last marriage put her in a little town of Menden, Michigan. The farm is still there. And second floor, they had, I think, 11 children there. <laughs> they, they had a room where they had boards installed into the walls, and that's where all the kids slept. So just to process what that experience was like and how it was to be poor and then how people now experience needs, wants, and desires. I just can't wait to explore it. Cool. Yeah. Um, was um, Somebody asked earlier, was Saving the Ghost inspired by any real life events? Oh, good question. <laughs> so Saving the Ghost... All right, the, the farm, the Bodie farm that I just told you about, I learned about the existence of that land, didn't know about the building, but the, the land a number of years ago, uh, due to family dysfunction, I did not know where my sister was buried. And it turned out she's buried in a little town west of Two Harbors, uh, Brimson, Minnesota. I say that name and a lot of people say, oh, I know Brimson, which is weird because it's just this little town in the middle of the woods. Anyway, so my husband and I drove up there to find the cemetery so I could, you know, acknowledge my sister. We couldn't find the cemetery. And so we stopped at a house that we passed by. And up there, the, it's not like a town that's laid out streets, one, two, three, ABC, in some sort of pattern. 
they're scattered. There's like a stick built house here. There's a, a mobile home over here. There's a, I don't know what that is over there. It's, it's just random. So I said, we got to stop, knocked on the door of someone. And this man, Harry McKinney, who has recently passed away, uh, answered the door, said, come on in. Uh, and I told him I was looking for the Brimson Cemetery. Well, he wanted to know who I was looking for. And I said, well, my sister, and I gave him the name. And then he said, well, and then I said, my uncle is there. And he said, well, what's the name? And I said, Bo, he said, John? He said, I knew John. <laughs> so this guy was in his 80, it was his 83rd birthday that day. And my uh, uncle would have been 30 years his senior. If he, my uncle used to take care of this Harry's horses. So I said, well, I can take you to the cemetery. I suppose you want to see the farm too. What farm? <laughs> so, far. so he dropped us off uh, into the cemetery, then dropped us off at this place. And we trespassed, I freely admit, and stepped on the land. And when I stood there, there was a story that came up in me that became, that initiated the writing of Saving the Ghost. However, as I worked on this book over, you know, three, four years, uh, it morphed. And there's a main character, Ellen McKinnis, who came out of somewhere and essentially announced, I want you to tell my story. I mean, not like that, but that's really what happened. And so this other story moved as a subplot to the, to the, later in the book. Interesting with that, and I have no explanation for it, there are true things that I learned since that are included in that writing, <laughs> that first writing. For example, the guy who lives there now, and the, you know, it's privately owned property, but he talked about when he first came up the area, he used to walk miles and miles. He walked everywhere. He just walked everywhere. And you know, there's like 20 miles between anything. He just walked everywhere. One of my characters in the book, he walks everywhere. He's in his 80s and he just walks everywhere. He doesn't want anybody to, there's just stuff like that that's like, I don't know. But that's what, is, yes, that's how that was inspired. Uh, and then to circle around and find the actual uh, structure that my father was born in is a whole new story. So, yeah, good question. Cool. Yeah. Um we have about um, 10 minutes left. So I thought I'd just double check with anybody to see if anybody else had any questions um, for the author. Everybody very quiet today. No. So, um, so I will say then that you can purchase author signed copies of my book off my website at Emmy Fuller Words, that's with an S.com, or you can get them through Amazon. And uh, if you sign up for my, my newsletter, I don't inundate people with stuff. I try to get one out once a month, but you know, maybe. Uh, but you'll see what the updated events are. So you'll know if there's going to be an in person event somewhere and you want to come and visit. That's great. I love, I love that. Yeah, we're hoping that we can get all the authors together for a big event in Wadena. Can we do, do it? Have, I, I do have another question. Oh, for, sure. Um, so do you find that your art, your painting, does anything to assist with your writing? Do you, do you find any connection between the two? Good question. Uh, I've been thinking about that a lot. So I have just entered a new dimension of painting. I've always kept to more illustrative style, more predictable style. I've, I've, I've edged up to abstract expressionism, but I didn't I, like writing. I didn't know enough about that there was a leap to take or how to take the leap. And so now I'm, you can see behind you, there's a painting started, who knows what it'll look like when it's done, but um, this abstract expressionism has liberated me in a way that I cannot define. However, it is the same process that happens when I write a book. There, yes, I mean, it's, it's stunning how whatever this is already exists. What I have to do is make myself available to it. 
And that's one of the tips with writing that you'll hear a lot is uh, put yourself in a timed writing uh, and just write. Don't think about what you're writing. And very often your subconscious is ready to tell you a story and you're so busy trying to edit it out <laughs> into something else that you don't get it. But if you, if you just write, you just paint, that story comes out. And it's pretty stunning how that happens. I don't know if any of you are writers or you've had that experience, but it's uh, it's remarkable. Yes, I know. Yes, I I know that experience, and it's uh, it's I used to describe it better than I could, but I've had that same kind of feeling that that I I know what I I know what I've, I'm gonna say. I know what it is, but I'm not close enough to it yet to actually articulate it and I I'm that way with design too um you know that I I look at things kind of like a bird's eye view like a, or like up at a up at a plane and, and I see everything very clearly but I can't read the words until I get close to it it's a it's an interesting feeling when you're taking taking that trajectory it is. And I, you know, I, I'm so enthusiastic about what I'm doing. I just say to somebody the other day, I'm not bragging. She said, no, you're not bragging. You're just enthusiastic. It's like, because it's all a wonderment to me. I can't, it's like I said, I don't teach because I, I don't know what to tell you. I can tell, I can demonstrate, I can share, but that it happens at all is so remarkable. I just can't, I have no words and I'm a writer. I should be able to tell you. And you're a, you're a writer. <laughs> And I'm a writer and I have no words for it, but it is, uh, and as I started uh, studying um, about the abstract expressionists in New York, that's something that they say that this is really, it comes from, really. it comes, you don't apply your mind to it. You just let it come. And as soon as you stop thinking, and if there's any advice to a writer, I guess that would be it, stop thinking so much. Just write it down. Editing can come later, but just let it come out. Um, and in the beginning, it'll look like this back here. You know, it'll look like, well, what all is that going on? And somehow it forms into a cohesive image that for me, I walk around my house and I just stare at things that I do because I can't quite get over the fact that I love them so much. And it's the same thing with the book. I write a lot of grants. I've never used that as an explanation of a grant writing. I don't. I don't think it would fly, but but I'm going to try it. Oh, they. You know, I learned from this last round of grants uh, with the um, Southwest Minnesota Regional Arts Council. God love them. Uh, I finally broke through the understanding of these grants want to teach you, or that these funds are supposed to help you learn something. And if you come up against something that you realize you've been blocked for a long time or just didn't understand that there was, there was something to get to, to explore that, that's what those funds are for. And then you share that. Like I share that all the time. Oh, go do it. Go do it. Go do it. You can do it. Go do it. Because um, you're not looking for an outcome. You're looking for learning. We, you know, everybody, I don't want to say everybody, but a lot of people seem to think or act as though the product is the destination. Product is something enjoyable you see in your rear view mirror as you're continuing to go to learn. Um, and you know, if you, if you write a book and it's a crummy book, so what? Write another one. It, it, it's, if you love it, if you enjoy it and you have the privilege to have the time and resources to do it, do it. Because there's a lot of people on this planet who will never have a moment of joy. So, you know, it's a gift you've been given. Use it. If you could, if you love it, do it. Yeah, why not? You know? I agree. Thank you very much. Yeah. Is there time? There's not time. I'd read you the last the next chapter. I got five minutes. You want to hear it or no? Sure. Go ahead. We love right. to hear when the author reads. I suppose I should look at the right book. <laughs> yes, okay. So I'm going to jump to chapter eight. 
All right, Larry set a flat of petunias down in the sidewalk as Gloria lifted a handkerchief to her eyes, dabbing away her tears. Gloria, what is wrong? Can I help? He spoke, oh, the title of this chapter is Gloria's Great Truth. He spoke in gentle tones as he approached her. Gloria slid to the far side of her bench, holding out her hand to signal he should stop from coming too close. What are you doing here? Granger ignored her warning and continued his advance. I brought the petunias you asked for. He turned his head to the flat of flowers. I thought they might cheer you and distract from your recent disturbances and trouble. Gloria rose to face him, commanding him to stop. Stay where you are, Larry Granger. You are, were in my house without invitation. She clasped her phone and prepared to call the police. Why? And don't you dare lie to me. Larry stayed put. I'm sorry, I apologized, and I'm here to apologize once again. The door was not locked, and when you didn't respond to my knock, I let myself in to check on you. Tell the truth or so help me, I will prosecute, I will prosecute you for trespassing. Gloria's face hardened with rage. I am telling you the truth. Granger was adamant and did not back down or away. Gloria, his eyes downcast, he spoke just above a mumble. I'm in love with you. He lifted his eyes to look into hers, and so I worry. Ever since your mother passed, leaving you here alone, I worry about you. She glared at him, sizzling. If you think that I'd accept your flirtatious bait instead of the truth, then you can leave and never come back and take that flat of petunias with you when you go. She took a step toward him as though she might slap him in the face, or I will call the police. Ranger did not protest, but tipped his sun hat to Gloria as he skirted the gifted flat of petunias. His arrogance was astounding and further to suspicions that he was up to no good where she was concerned. Alone again in her garden with the sound of his farmer's truck driving off, Gloria considered all that had transpired yesterday. She looked at her phone for a moment, then called Detective Franklin. Detective Franklin, this is Gloria Stanch. I have my husband's wedding ring. Now I want his finger and the rest of him. I believe his brother Morton had the ring all along and set up those boys to plant it in my bridal wreath bush. I don't know how and I don't know why, but I believe Larry Granger is in on it with Morton. Detective Franklin listened without interruption. And I cannot figure out why there was blood on my bridal wreath bush. There was blood on it before Hank Broden spilled his paint bucket. Did you test it? Whose blood is it? I am overrun with suspicious characters and evidence that reads to me like there is a criminal cover-up in process, or perhaps a plot is building against me. I'm quite afraid. Within three minutes, sirens could be heard wailing down Gloria Street. Four squad cars and a forensic team swarmed her backyard before she could muster herself off the garden bench. Franklin approached Gloria. We can sit over there. She rose and pointed to a pair of ironwork chairs near her mother's chair of the fountain, bubbling faithfully, lending an air of calm to this terrible moment. You've had a lot of trouble in the last day. I'm sorry that you've been put in this position. Franklin's tone was soothing and her manner sincere. We still have quite a lot to talk about, don't we? Gloria nodded in assent. I want to know where my husband is. There was such a sadness in her voice. Her shoulders sloped a bit as she turned her face away from Franklin and toward her mother's chair of fountain. She straightened and gave Franklin a piercing look. Did you call the parents of those boys? The officers that were here last night were useless and fools and more trouble than they were worth. Franklin took notes as Gloria spoke. What did happen last night, Mrs. Stanch? She recounted her awful fright and ensuing disappointment and discussed with the boys hiding in her bridal wreath bush but it was the visit by Mr. Boone that had her the most unnerved and distrustful. Who was he to insert himself this way and in the middle of the night entering my house without invitation? I believe he is a liar and I wonder now if he has anything to do with the appearance of my husband's wedding ring. He met with us yesterday, correct? Yes, and Mr. Granger, the man who walked in on us, I believe he's involved as well. You believe, Mrs. Stanch, that Mr. Boone and Mr. Granger and Mr. Morton Stanch are in cahoots. What else could it be? Gloria could not arrive at a unifying theory for the unexpected presence of all three men at the same time in her yard and garden and home and hospital room. I met Mr. Boone at the hospital when I needed to drive to take me home. As you know, he volunteers. He couldn't have known I would be next on his delivery list. 
It seems unlikely, Mrs. Stan. She knew your mother well, correct? Gloria threw up her hands and interrupted. Detective Franklin, what about my husband's decoy finger? Where is Julian? Isn't that where we should begin this investigation? All the rest looks like a healthy pile of red herrings to me. She was furious, not at Detective Franklin, who was doing her job, surely, but at everyone else and about everything that was happening to her. I honestly don't care about those men. Well, I do. They shouldn't be showing up on my property at all hours. But I deeply care about the remains of my husband. There was the truth of it. I deeply care. <clears throat> Excuse me. Just then, Hank rode around to the house to the back and walked straight away into one of the forensics officers. The officer's yelp was heard for at least three blocks. Jeez, he stopped himself short as he flailed his arms, fighting with himself to keep balance. And at that moment, the cat made a dash from beneath the bridal wreath bush that had been under examination. The teetering officer's back left foot settled with his full weight on the cat's tail. The cat in full screech furthered the toppling. The officer would have landed on his back on the ground if Hank Roden hadn't been quick to grab his arms and pull him forward. Roden was small and stocky. The officer was tall and lanky. Together they balanced each other until they didn't. The cat was long gone. Gloria burst. The tears would not stop. My cat, where's my cat? She sobbed and cried. It was all too much. She could no longer pretend that the turbulent events of the last two days hadn't exposed her every need and longing to feel safe and certain and loved. Her wounded cat, scared and lost somewhere in the garden, underscored her pain. I must find him. Gloria called for the cat who wouldn't come. She dried her eyes, her back to the investigative team, then turned to face Detective Franklin. As long as Julian's body is missing, I have hope that he will come back. Whatever he's been doing will have brought him to his senses and home. His wedding ring does not prove he's dead. It proves to me that maybe, maybe he was trying to return and was prevented from doing so, most likely by Morton. I will make it my first priority to uncover once and for all exactly what happened to your husband. My team will investigate other aspects of this case and will report to me. But I assure you that I agree. Your husband's whereabouts, alive or dead, begs a thorough investigation. Gloria spotted the cat settling down under a lilac bush, a freshly captured mouse in its jaws. She studied the bubbling fountain and listened to its gentle gurgle. Thank you, Detective Franklin. Thank you. I would suggest, however, that you invite someone to stay with you until we figure out what's going on and that you replace all the locks in your house and install, immediately install a security system. I will do no such thing, Detective Franklin. Gloria stood firm on her ground as an independent woman who could manage even these extraordinary circumstances. Just then, Lucille Parsons arrived in Gloria's backyard carrying a gift basket of freshly baked muffins. She stopped in her tracks, struck by all the commotion around Gloria's bridal wreath bush. Hank Broden was getting to his feet, and the officer he'd knocked over was up and well away from the handyman. One of the team shouted out to Detective Franklin, there isn't any blood here. Franklin looked inquisitive, inquisitively at Gloria. Well, I did try to clean my bush with soap and water as I may have removed the evidence. So I may have removed the evidence, Gloria frowned. I suppose I washed away evidence. Wait, we found something. The officer was shouting again. Franklin left Gloria's side to see what the team had uncovered. This is Stanch, Lucille Person still standing in the same spot also shouted out. Is it all right for me to enter? Gloria, unaware that Lucille was in her backyard, studied her for a moment, then waved her in and over to the bench. Yes, yes, Lucille Mueller nearly tripped over the forgotten flat of petunias. Gloria noticed Hank Roden standing near the officers and called out, Hank, come here. Hank didn't move a muscle or twitch. Hank, she barked his name. At that, Hank Roden turned his head toward Gloria and pointed back toward her bridal wreath bush. The team stood back from Franklin as she squatted to inspect something on the ground. Gloria stood, ignoring Lucille, and made her way to Broden to find out what had stuck him in place and pointing. Lucille set the basket of muffins on the ironwork table between the chairs next to the bubbling fountain and peered at Hank and Gloria and Detective Franklin as they all stooped down in unison to inspect something that she could not make out. Sherman, Franklin shouted to one of her forensic officers, how in hell did you all miss this? <laughs> well, you're ready to read, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Yes, thanks, Maggie. What? I said, yeah, I'm ready to read it. Thank Good. you for reading another another chapter. Well, I appreciate you all for letting me uh, letting me do this. I know I'm not the most professional guest you've had, but probably the most fun. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. Definitely it's, fun. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's very good. See. Thank you so much for participating in both it. online edition. Um, we are recording for, for this. We'll be up on the website in a couple of weeks, along with all the other recordings that we have done over the last year and a half. And even when we go back to in-person meetings, I think we're going to keep this process of recording them because it's nice to have that history. Yeah, I agree. Oh, good. And I'm, I don't know about any of you, but I'm in love with YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> I watch painters and I listen to authors and I just, oh, I can't get enough of it. Wonderful, Great. wonderful. Thank well, you. Soon you will be on there. Thanks. Anything else? Okay. All right. Well, we look forward to getting a chance to meet you in person in the future when we have all our authors. And perhaps we'll see you again when your well, when your next book comes out. And thank you all for coming and joining us with um Emmy Fuller, Maggie. Um, and we will see you next month. Yay. Thank you.